Hi guys, tonight we're going to be talking about the digestive system. So since we're all heterotrophs, we have to eat our things in order eat things in order to uh, get proteins, fats, sugars, vitamins. So we eat food, our digestive tract breaks it down into simple building blocks like amino acids that can be absorbed by the body um, and then actually used. So remember during embryogenesis, the digestive tract is the first thing to form. So the gastrula is this tube that runs from our mouth all the way to our anus. And we're going to talk a lot about that whole track tonight. So by the end of this video, should, you should be able to answer the purpose of the digestive system, uh, the secrets to successful digestion, uh, the structures of the digestive system, the functions, and how the digestive system relates to our circulatory system. So make sure you listen carefully to that. And also at the end, there are five other questions that I want to make sure that you got. Um, so make sure to listen all the way to the end. So like I said, the digestive system is an open tube from your mouth all the way to your anus or the toilet as we might think of it. And not all digestive tracts are created equally. Digestive tracts differ depending upon the type of animal um, and the type of food that's being eaten. For example, cows' digestive systems are really complex because they eat grass all day. It takes about 80 hours to process their food. Um, you have to break down all that cellulose from the different plants. And humans have a pretty good digestive tract because it's, it's multi-purpose. We're omnivores, so we eat both plants and meat. Um, but mainly digestive tracts are made up of the mouth, an esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestines. So let's just get it out there. Yes, there are some really gross parts to digestion, and yes, we're going to talk about them in this video. One of the great things about our digestive system is that it runs is run by our autonomic nervous system. So we don't ever really have to think about it, except for maybe the last part where we do have some control when we decide when we want to go and when we need to hold it. So throughout our digestive system, we use a lot of enzymes to help break down our food. And we're going to talk a lot about several of those enzymes. Um, we also use bacteria, which live in our gut, and that also helps break down our food. And finally, I want you to know the secret to successful digestion is maximizing surface area. We're going to talk about two ways that surface area has, is maximized. So the first step in the breakdown process is chewing our food with our teeth starts in our mouth. So by doing this, we are maximizing the surface area on the food. So we take a big chunk of food, say an apple, and we break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. The tongue helps move that food around, and then the salivary, salivary glands um, supply saliva, which includes an enzyme called amylase. This starts digestion, digesting starch into glucose. The more you chew bread, the sweeter it tastes. So um, these, this is what amylase is doing, is breaking down that bread, that starch, into glucose. Um, amylase doesn't work on non-sugary foods like cheese or meat. But those types of foods get worked on later by chemicals um, in different parts of our digestive system. If we just ate a big piece of food and then swallowed it before we chewed it, the digestive system would have a really hard time dealing with this big piece of food because the acids and enzymes and bacteria would never be able to break down all the way through that solid piece of food. So remember, chewing increases the surface area of food and then the chemicals break it down further. So next, that chewed up food gets swallowed and finds itself in the pharynx or your throat. There's a really cool flap called the epiglottis that blocks your trachea, where your air is, um, from your food so the food you swallow doesn't get into your lungs. Just to know, let you know, a ball of food is sometimes called a bolus, so you can see a bolus moving from your mouth all the way down into your stomach. Um, the bolus must pass first through a sphincter into the digestive tract to get into your stomach. A sphincter is just a circular muscle that's usually contracted and then relaxes when things need to enter or exit. So the sphincter at the top of the stomach keeps, keeps stomach acids in and other stomach contents um, from pushing up into the esophagus. The muscles in the esophagus work in a wave-like motion called peristalsis, which pushes food down the esophagus into the stomach. This helps keep food moving along the digestive tract. All right, now we're in the stomach. 
And it, like I said before, the food is going to enter the stomach through a sphincter that's going to regulate the contents of the stomach, keeping everything that's in the stomach inside the stomach. And the stomach is where most of the work on breaking down the food happens. It's like a churning mixer, turning food over and over and breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces. This process is completed by the circular and longitudinal muscles that are along the stomach and help that churning go along. In addition to breaking food into smaller pieces, the stomach is going to take care of a few other things too. It's going to store food uh, temporarily. And some of its cells are going to secrete gastric juices, like pepsin. This is an enzyme that digests proteins into amino acids. As you guys probably know, every enzyme has an optimal pH that it works. And pepsin's optimal pH is really acidic. So that works out pretty fine because your stomach secretes another gastric juice called hydrochloric acid. Um, if you were to put your hand in hydrochloric acid, it would give you a really nasty chemical burn because hydrochloric acid's pH is about one or maybe two. Um, so how in the world is your stomach not getting eaten up by this, this hydrochloric acid? Well, there's this thick layer of mucus that is also secrete, secreted as a gastric juice, and that lines your stomach um, so the, P, the low pH doesn't hurt you. Very rarely does the stomach rupture. Um, that would almost kill you always because of this crazy high acid. Um, but techniques like burping to get rid of the gas or even maybe vomiting to keep it from filling up too much happen. Uh, you guys know those people who do food eating contests? Well, they're crazy because they train their stomachs not to release this overwhelming content and can sometimes even have explosion, uh, rupturing stomachs. So as food is exiting the stomach and moving into our small intestines, it becomes a form of Chyme. It's chyme is um, a liquidy substance, um, something you might be familiar with if you remember the last time you might have had a stomach virus. Nobody likes talking about diarrhea, but when your body is infected, it doesn't really care much about absorbing nutrients. It wants to get things out as quickly as possible. Um, so there's a sphincter at the bottom of your stomach that regulates how much chyme um, exits, exits the stomach. So from the stomach, the food's going to enter the small intestine, which actually is not small at all. It's amazingly long, and it can range anywhere from 4.5 to 10.5 meters. It has an average length of about 22 feet long. It's folded up into layers in the abdomen to fit all inside of our body. Um, and the duodenum is the upper region of the small intestines, and this is where chemical digestion happens, where each of those macromolecules are being broken down into smaller and smaller um, building blocks. Bicarbonate is secreted uh, in order to break down and neutralize that stomach acid. That's why if you ever have an upset stomach, you might take al Alka-Seltzer. It's just bicarbonate. So the pancreas is going to secrete enzymes, which is going to help break down your food. And with the help from your gallbladder, the small intestines is where we're going to break down our fat. So bile salts which are made in the liver and then stored in the gallbladder are squirted out into the small intestine. Bile is just like a dish detergent. It takes the fat and emulsifies it or breaks it down into smaller pieces called fatty acids and monoglycerides. Further down in the small intestines are the ileum and the duodenum regions. And the job of these sections are to absorb nutrients like amino acids, glucose, fatty acids, and glycerols that are released by digestion. So how does the small intestine actually absorb our food? So on the inner surface of the small intestine are these little folds in the lining, um, these little protrusions. These are called villi. And each of these villi are covered by tinier and smaller folds called microvilli. These all increase the surface area of the small intestine so that there's more surface for absorption. Again, remember I said surface area is one of the keys and secrets to a successful digestion. The circulatory system enters here where the capillaries go into these tiny folds and allow all of that broken down food to be absorbed into your bloodstream and then delivered throughout your body. These folds and fibers on fibers make up a lot of area. Just like the lungs, which has lots of surface area to get oxygen into our bodies, our small intestines have a surface area of about 250 square meters. I wouldn't like to see that spread out of a football field. That would be really gross. 
all of these different folds um, make a texture of what is described as velvet, which is also gross. Have I grossed you out yet? All right, so after it passes through the winding path of the small intestine and exits another sphincter, it enters the large intestine, or also known as our colon. So um, it's been digested into usable bits and absorbed, and this leftover indigestible waste enters the cesium of the large intestine. And the job of the final part of the digestive system is to remove water and bile salts from the chyme to form solid feces. This is so you don't have constant diarrhea, which would also be gross. This, everything's really gross. I'm sorry, guys. It is the large intestine because it's wide, but not because it's long. It's only about 1.5 meters long, which is still pretty long. It's equivalent to about five feet. It's that final lap of our food, the final victory lap, which just wraps right around the small intestine. At the end of the cesium is a little finger-like extension called an appendix. And we talked a little bit about this um, before when we were talking about vestigial structures. Sometimes the appendix can get infected, and um, when it does that, it's called appendicitis, and then it can get removed by a, a surgeon. But uh, we still don't quite know what it does. Um, some people still think it's vestigial, but others think that its purpose might be to act as a safe house for all your good bacteria. Um, let's say you got an illness and your body got really sick. It tries to kill off all the bacteria in your body. You need your bacteria to process your food. So the appendix hold, holds on to some of it um, until you're over your illness, and then it might spit some of that bacteria back out to recolonize your gut. So the food can spend as long as three days in your digestive tract, and that's mostly spent in your large intestine, reabsorbing water and preparing your poo to come out. Um, the feces is stored in the rectum, and that passes outside the body through the anus. Feces are still comprised mostly of water, along with a few bacteria, some undigestive stuff like cellulose, as well as salts, bile pigments, and dead cells. Finally, to end the digestive system, your processed food, um, or undigested food, leaves through two anal sphincters into the toilet. We're done. Digestive system is over, thank God. So now we've gone through the hole from the mouth all the way to the anus, and you should be able to answer these questions. The purpose of the digestive system, the secrets for successful digestion, um, the structures of the digestive system, the functions, and how the digestive system can relate to the circulatory system, where that happens. I also want you to test how well you listen to this video. So can you tell me where the bile is produced? What organ secretes pepsin? What organ secretes the digestive enzymes into the duodenum? What enzyme breaks down starch in the mouth? And what are the series of wave-like muscle contractions that propel, along, propel food along the digestive tract? If you can't answer those, go back, see if you can find them, and then write them down. All right, see you guys tomorrow.